So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahilladhi qasurat an ra'yatihi absarun nazirin. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul uqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli amin ya Rabbi. Today I want to talk about certain philosophies, as you'll see, that became very uh, well known and pre prevalent in the 18th and 19th century that have created the society that we live in, in this godless society. And it's very important to be aware of these things because it, it really opens your eyes to the level of impact. And so we'll be discussing some of these aspects of, see, uh, let me share this with you, that uh, in the beginning, right, when the uh, when the this kind of like the modern world started, uh, the idea was that man is the peak of the man is the peak of the uh, the the this the the food chain, and that man is like the peak of everything. And in some ways, man and uh, secular uh, like Darwinism, evolution, all that agreed with religion in a sense that religion also says man is God's greatest masterpiece. Man is God's greatest masterpiece, or in the Bible, the image, man is created in the image of God. In the in the خلق in the Quran, I created him with my both hands. Uh, even though uh, I do have to say that you know, kind of like this secular idea that man is at the peak of creation, at the top of the food chain of creation, from a religious perspective, our Salaf really didn't talk about us human beings from that perspective because obviously they're angels that have a higher rank than many human beings and there are many jinns that have a higher rank than many human beings but there is something special about man okay and uh, so that is uh, fair enough okay that there's something special about man and uh, but uh, what I'm trying to point out here is that just as the secular world said look at evolution man is at the peak of this evolutionary process Religion also, uh, in response, said, yes, human beings are at the peak of this evolutionary process. So, while at, uh, what happened is that religion was replaced by reason. And revelation was replaced by reason. And over here is a very important point that I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm just going to give you a hint that emotions have to do with spirituality. And because emotions, especially positive emotions like shukr and repentance and guilt have to do with spirituality, so they made a even a barrier between, oh, emotions are bad, reason is good. Now, there is a, you can say, uh, a, like a, um, a contradiction here, which I'm not going to talk about today. But this is how modernity started. Modernity started with man is the peak of creation. Man is the top thing. Man is God. Man is at the top of the scale of everything. And so we, we did away with transcendent. We did away with God. And we made man the measurement of everything. Man determines his own laws. The man determines everything. And we began to become a godless society. But as the Quran says, if you forget Allah, Allah will make you forget yourself. So the process started with making man high, man is so great, man can solve all the problems of the world, we got science on our side, we got our rationality on our side, we got our, you know, all that, we got, we got that, right? Um, so what has happened is what Sutul Hashar talks about, don't be like those who forget Allah. Allah will make you forget yourself. You'll become dehumanized. You'll put yourself in a situation where you, where in the 19th century, basically from Britain, man became the peak of creation, secular or religious. But then now in the postmodern world in America, the peak is what? the dehumanization of man which i'm going to discuss this very topic today how man what and you know when you study a certain philosophy uh there are two things that we should as muslims keep in mind in addition to other things for example which type of heart is saying and coming out with this philosophy is this philosophy coming from somebody like imam ghazali 
or uh, is this philosophy coming from somebody who is, uh, you know, very pious? Or is this philosophy coming from a heart that is uh, dealing with the occult sciences? Or, <coughs> so what type of heart is this philosophy coming from? And number two, uh, also with that, is to consider who is funding the popularity of this philosophy? Where is the money coming and where is the money going? So keep this in mind. And I'm going to mention these two because I'm not going to talk about these two aspects so much today because uh, we'll talk about that at another time, inshallah. Okay. So in at first, man was at the peak of society. Man is the peak of the food chain. Man is so great. Man makes his laws. Man is his own idol. And what did it end up becoming? After certain philosophies like uh, the one existentialism, which we're going to take a look at today. After uh, the philosophy of determinism, which became very popular. After uh, uh, um, the philosophies of social Darwinism, right? And that led to a whole bunch of uh, uh, things that we're going to talk about. So now let us start from when you replaced God, First, you said, oh, modernity comes, man's the best, and we don't need God. We're going to replace ourselves with God. And the result now is we've dehumanized ourselves. Okay, So much so that there are studies almost in every aspect of human life Okay, on the uh, inhumanity, dehumanization, and how to resist it, making monsters uncanny power of dehumanization, dehumanization of art and other essays, Okay, less than human why we demean, enslave, and exterminate others, okay? Uh, uh, dehumanization and technology, ideology and insanity, okay? Dehumanization of man, humiliation, degradation, dehumanization, human dignity violated, etc., etc. Mortal engines, the science of performance and dehumanization of sport, okay? The invisible mind, uh, and it continues. So there are all these books that have come out uh, in the uh, field of man now being alienated, dehumanized by his own very philosophies that he adopted in modernity. And now as a result of those philosophies, now he's become dehumanized. So what are those uh, philosophies that have de dehumanized us? Okay, so now let me just uh, move forward a little bit here. Um, so let's... Uh, Let's talk about uh, this a little bit, okay? That uh, let's talk about this. So, the, in in the early nineteenth century, there was an idea called law of nature, okay? Law of nature. That is what that every human being innately knows right and wrong. Every human being innately knows right and wrong. This is in the early 19th century when England was still in power. Okay, this was the idea is that we follow the law of nature. We follow, you know, whatever uh, whatever nature tells us to do. We understand that. Then what happened? Then you had ideas like existentialism, for example, uh, or determinism. That you, Oh, no, there's no natural law. You're just a product of your society. You're, you're, if you're... If your father was an alcoholic, you'll most likely be an alcoholic. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Okay. That uh, if, uh, you, you know, everything is your environment, Skinner's uh, work, for example, your environment determines who you are. So there's a denial of uh, natural law. So if you look at, for example, one of the great uh, Christian philosophers, uh, Lewis, okay, uh, he says, uh, for example, St. Paul explains the idea in Roman 2, 14 to 16. Uh, for when the Gentiles, meaning the non-believers, do not have the law, do not have the law to do extensively, ex instinctively the things of the law. Meaning, they don't murder because it's instinctive, right? It's, even though the law is don't murder, but they do instinctively what the law requires. These, not having the law, are a law to themselves. Uh in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. So the law, the moral law, is written in their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness 
their thoughts uh, alternately accusing or defending them okay so this is how it started uh, we don't need God but we have natural law okay so this idea that we don't need God but we have natural law. Natural law tells us, the nature tells us, which is another word to replace God, by the way, nature. But nature tells us what is right and wrong. Nature just tell, told us through the process of evolution or whatever you may consider. Okay. So uh, I'll just read this. Uh, Lewis summarizes the natural law tradition written on the heart in its Judeo-Christian Greco-Roman glory and thus stands in the tradition of giants of Western civilization, such as Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, say, uh, Thomas Aquinas. He also draws upon the... Uh, and, and this goes on, okay? But the idea here is, the uh, in his book that he wrote, Evolution of Man, is that uh, natural law is, uh, as it says here, is the notion that there is an innate and native understanding of right and wrong that is possession of every human being, okay? So this is how uh, it started uh, early uh, philosophy during the Renaissance. This is kind of like where the direction it was going in natural law. Okay, and a lot of philosophers were talking about, we believe in natural law, we believe in natural law. Well, at least you believe in something innate that has to do with good and bad, right? And uh, from there, you can at least argue with these people, okay, if you have good and you have bad and you have a natural law, then don't you think there's a day of judgment? Because the idea of law written in your heart uh, does not make sense unless you believe that you're actually going to be taken to account for that law that's in your heart. So in Islam, as you know, it starts from what? The, there's a truth. And all religions, of course, believe that there's a truth. But in Islam, the truth is what? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِي I have not created man or jinn except they become my servants. Okay, that is the purpose of your life. Your life is to become his abd. Okay, and the prophet is abduhu, his special servant. Abduhu, his exclusive servant of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the purpose of life is to be his servant. So what did uh, modernity comes along and says, oh, there is no truth and there is no natural law. We're going to replace these ideas with other ideas. Okay. So that's that's the first thing that happened. So then people like David Hume, and Hume come along, and what happens? We move from a place where man has a definite purpose, there's a definite truth, a definite direction to life, and they come along and they say, oh, nope, that's, that's not happening. Intentionally or unintentionally, again, that we will discuss later. But man replaced... The idea of revelation with reason. Okay? And so now reason becomes the most important thing. Okay? It becomes the most important thing. And in that, especially scientism and some of these philosophers that came along, they play like Darwin and so on because he was a natural philosopher in the beginning. Uh, he wasn't a scientist. They didn't have scientists at that time. They had natural philosophers. So... They said, okay, we're going to do away with uh, religion. We don't need religion. And we don't need religion to explain our world. The thing that comes on top is going to be human rationality. And we're going to, exp we're going to make reason uh, replace revelation. Okay? And so therefore man became his own determin de determinator of, of, of himself. He made his own laws. He broke his own laws. Okay? So one thing to keep in mind here is that when we removed religion, so now your, 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 the ideal is no longer to be the slave of Allah, to be the creation of Allah. And now you are yourself the goal. Human, human, humanism came along. And humanism was going to determine humanity. And humanism was going to determine everything. And for that, it was considered reason is enough. We don't need revelation. We need we don't need anything other than our reason, our rationale, um, to know the truth. Okay, and so now humanism takes the place of religion, and that, as you will see, has very devastating consequences. So, as humanism, 
on the one side was rationalize, to rationalize, to do away with religion. We don't need God, so on and so forth. So on the one side, it was that. And on the other side, man, his new ideal was human himself. Okay. As this is happening in history, as humans are talking about how they're the peak of evolution, as humans are talking about humanism and some of the philosophies around it, what else is happening in the process? Uh, so that's what we're going to now discuss. And the way human, human, uh, human, we, meaning the uh, human beings, the way the West left our Budiya, worshipping Allah, becoming his Abd as a universal concept of, uh, of, of what our ideal is, and replaced it with humanism as the new ideal. Now, a, the phenomenon that is taking place, that we're even getting rid of this uh, idea that human beings are an ideal. And so there's no universal concept of Arbudi, of course. And there's no universal concept that man is something that Allah made. And this, this has a religious aspect to it because religion also says this, so they want to get out of that too. So now there's no universal uh, law or universal ideal that maintains that man is at the peak. Uh, man is the best of creation. Because as long as man is the best of creation, there's always the question of wealth. You know, uh, then the question of God naturally comes in. That whom, that, you know, that, that we have uh, this innate knowledge of right and wrong and we are the peak of God's creation and so on and so forth. And it, 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 it has similar, you can say, uh, idea of religion, right? And so now the new phenomenon of whether you call it postmodernity, or whether you call it alienation, or whether you call it whatever, uh, now the new phenomenon is man is no longer his own ideal. Okay, and so, so now instead of having humanism as the ideal, a universal ideal, what has happened? Oh, it's just particulars. You are who you think you are. Your purpose of life is whatever you think it is. And I'm going to give now the historical document, you can say the intellectual history of this. And its worst peak, which I'm not going to talk about today, but its worst peak of this idea of humanism, where we're humans and we're going to get along, and then breaking that. Just as we said no to God, then we're saying no to humanism. And what is the result? I mean, of course, the result is very chaotic for anybody that has any sense. But the result of that is what? The worst result of that is going to be the, the types of feminism and the types of homosexuality and the types of different lifestyles that will come out because... There, there's no universal humanity. You are whatever you decide to be. So now let's take a look at this. This idea that I'm mentioning has been mentioned by many philosophers. One of them, uh, Francis uh, Schaeffer, in his book, Escape from Reason. I just want to uh, mention uh, a summary of his chapter uh, 3 and uh, parts of chapter 4 very quickly. In chapter 3, he notes the following the Renaissance Reformation period, the problem of nature and grace turned into the problem instead of nature and freedom. So nature and freedom. Freedom here means that do human beings have free will? And the early philosophers believed that no, there's no free will. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that in some detail here. Of course, the autonomous nature soon ate up freedom, meaning nat there's only nature. And of course, they used the word nature instead of God. There's only nature and you don't have freedom. Okay, you are the result of your society. If your dad was drunk, you will be drunk. And if um, you were born poor, you will then act in a certain way. And we can determine if you're going to be a criminal in the future or so on and so forth. So, of course, the autonomous nature soon ate up freedom, meaning free will. And he illustrates this as he quickly, uh, he runs quickly through the philosophies of Kant, Rousseau, Hegel, uh, uh and others. Finally, he gets off to his oft-discussed line of despair. Okay, if you're like, why? Which arises from the abandonment of hope of a unified answer for knowledge in life. I mean, if there's no purpose in life, 
then there's only despair. There's only nihilism. There's only existentialism. So in chapter 4, Schaefer adds that because of the inevitable drawing of this line of despair, man as man is dead. You have simply mathematics, particulars, mechanics. Man has no meaning, no purpose, no significance. There's only pessimism concerning man as man. Thus he comes, uh, uh, so, you know, so this is what basically he was saying. So the same thing that I'm saying just in a different way and much even before our time. Okay, and then he wrote another book called Escape from Reason. Uh, okay, now let's continue, inshallah. Uh, yeah, so let me start by some of these uh, uh, works that became very, very popular. Okay. Uh, this is one of the works where it talks about the idea of determinism, okay? So, in the very beginning, uh, determinism, so as human made himself the top, so one of the main philosophies was determinism. You are the result of your society. If you are in a concentration camp, as it talks about in this book, then, you know, you'll have certain qualities, okay? Um, and uh, uh, your environment determines who you are very much like skinner and his uh you know ringing the bell and the animal salivating for food so you're you're just there's no there's no natural law there's no right and wrong okay so in this idea of humanism okay what came rationality what did rationality produce rationality produced oh you don't have free will rationality produced science scientism produced that oh you're a result of your society you don't even like you don't even have free will and so that's what uh so they maintained nature and did away with this concept of freedom whereas islam comes and the prophets come and they say no you have free will and you're you have free will and that means you're responsible whereas humanism came and humanism said there is no free will determinism came determinism existentialism they both said human beings have no free will. We're the result of our society. Simple as that. In fact, uh, when I was taking a sociology class, I think it was when I was in high school, uh, we were in one of the classes discussing how one lawyer got another killer off uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, his, uh, his crime by saying what? Oh, yeah, he was born poor and he saw a lot of murder and he ended up murdering. And I, I think he was a famous basketball player. It was a famous case, case, but this lawyer got him off because man is a result of his society, is his, his and and it's not his fault; it's a society's fault. And so this is what humanism gave us as a gift, okay? And now it's even worse because now those gifts of humanism, their eggs are breeding a culture of dehumanization. So this idea that uh, man is at the top of the food chain. This anthropocentric uh, idea that man is something special. So this uh, German zoologist, Ernest Haeckel, was one of the first people to try to blow this. Uh, you know, he was a eugenist, right? Uh, he was a naturalist, philosopher, physician, professor, marine biologist. He said, who are we to say that human beings are at the top of the scale? Okay, so this was one of his, uh, and of course, uh, Dockings, uh, you know, the, what's his name? Uh, Richard Dockings, I think it is. Uh, Peter Singer, also. Uh, he believed in the utilitarian. You only be nice because it helps you, you know, get along with people, not because you're actually good. But uh, Singer, an Australian moral philosopher, currently uh, the DeCamp professor of bioethics in Princeton University, specializes in applied ethics and approaches ethical issues from a secular utilitarian perspective. And so one of his philosophies is also why why is hum, why should my, man is human hu, the idea of humanity or anthro uh, this kind of like anthro uh, being human has some sort of like fodila or some greatness to it being human no no we're just like any other animals we're like you know we're not special in any way okay and so this is a very important part of their uh, perspective and so. This was beginning a long time ago. And then, of course, Richard Doc, uh, uh, 
uh, Dawkins uh, has the same idea that, uh, you know, we're not perfect beings and uh, evolution is still going to continue, whether through cultural evolution of technology, however it is, right? He was an evolutionary biologist and so he believes that we should not consider ourselves something special. This is a religious idea, which these people are very, very vehemently against. Again, I will uh, say something very important. It's very important to see which hearts are saying this and who are funding these ideas. Because uh, at a later time, inshallah, I'll discuss those issues in more detail. Okay, and then you have... Uh, and what is the result of this? The result of these types of ideas is what is called social Darwinism. That, and, and I'm going to talk about this, but this guy, human beings aren't important. You know, why are we trying to preserve every human being? Trying to preserve every rich, poor, uh, handicapped person? Why do that? We're not that special that even if a human being has broken bones and, you know, is born blind, we need to keep them alive. Human beings are not sacred by their virtue of being born, okay? So what did this professor? Uh, professor Eric Pinka, I think is his name, okay? So what happens as a result? He gives a lecture, top scientist advocates genocide of 90% of the world population. This guy from Texas, okay? Uh, professor Eric Pinka, an eminent ecologist, right? Who studies, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, we human beings are so bad, we're going to ruin the, uh, 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 the uh, environment. We human beings are so bad that we're going to ruin everything. And we should, we are, you know, why do we make ourselves sacred? Uh, we, we need to get rid of ourselves, right? This is like somebody that wants to do, like an individual that wants to do suicide or an individual who is, you know, hurting himself by piercing themselves, a type of like a mini, uh, uh, you know, suicide, right? So he wants to do this at the collective level. Let's kill 90% of human human beings. So we went from humanism, human beings are ideal, to what? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. There's too many poor people. We're not, we're not that worthy that we need to keep poor people alive. So this idea of social Darwinism, which I'm only mentioning, the idea of existentialism, the idea of that uh, determinism, so these are the philosophies that now when you made man in charge and man sees without revelation, there's no light. And man, humanism, humanity and the thinkers are seeing the world around us, right? And they're not even able to judge based upon their fitra. They do away with fitra. They do away with the natural law and they replace it with what? Uh, ideas like ex existentialism, your life has no purpose. Ideas like social Darwinism, that the rich need to prosper and the poor people, we need to get rid of them. Okay. The idea is that man is not at the top, is not sacrosanct. Man is not special. Okay. In any way that we need to keep every human being alive. It's okay if we get rid of a few billion. Okay. This, uh, is especially going to be liked by which? The rich and the famous. I mean, like, yeah, we, why should our taxes go to the poor people? Okay, so this is exactly like the Ayan Sutul Yasin. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ قَالُوا Why should we feed those? مَا لَمْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَتْعَمَا Allah didn't feed them, so why are we going to feed them? This is the attitude of social Darwinism. So man himself became a monster who doesn't want to help other, other human beings and he sees the others as subhuman, right? So this culture of subhumanism starts and it even gets worse than that, okay? Uh, so if we continue here, right? Uh, uh, this philosopher, for example, very famous philosopher, uh, I just have a hard time saying his name because of my dyslexia, Heidegger's anti-anthropocentrism, uh, uh, that uh, anthropocentrism means the idea that man is his own ideal. So now he's like, oh, you know, this is a guy from Seattle University. Uh, why should man uh, be at the top, uh, consider himself sacred? You're not special. You're still part of the, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not special. Okay. And so as you can see here, between species, 
So we're between still there's another species that's going to come after us. We're bad for the environment and we've done no good in the world. And so we need, it's better just to get rid of us. Maybe you all have seen their pictures to this, right? Uh, man is, there's first animals and then, you know, we transition to human beings. This was considered like, okay, you know, man is the ideal. We're at the peak now. And now towards a less anthropocentric neuroethics. That's where we're going now. Okay. And so it's no longer about, uh, you know, the making of human anthropocentrism in the modern social thought. Okay. So basically what's happening as a result is that man is no longer special. And therefore, if you're rich, get rid of the spe They're not special. They're not sacred. Just like we kill animals, we can kill human beings. Okay. So along came this philosopher named Comte. Okay. Uh, John Stuart Mill was his student. He had other students. Uh, he believed what? That uh, in, in lo logical po positivism, that you cannot uh, know the metaphysical. You cannot know about God. You cannot know about anything unseen. We only look at this, the data of our gathered around from us through our senses, you can say. And he's the one who coined the term sociology. Okay. He's the one who coined the term sociology. He also coined another very good word called altruism, uh, which is to do good to other people. But he's the one who came up with the idea of sociology. And sociology should be studied, of course, without uh, the ideas of God and so on and so forth. I'll mention something here interesting that it's very interesting when sociology has different ideas about humanity than psychology. And it's very interesting when psychology and sociology both have different ideas of humanity than anthropology. Because anthropology has really given sociology and, 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 and psychology a very hard time. Um, but I'll leave that for another time. Now, the other element that came along under humanism uh, was the study by this person named Galton. He was the, you could say, the father of eugenics. Okay, uh, he studied uh, uh, genes and studied human beings and their their genes and how uh, you know some people that are born poor they're going to have certain problems. People that are born rich are going to be more successful. And so he was uh, really like uh, a, a very important part of this whole humanism aspect. So on the one time point you have uh you know ideas uh okay so let me just uh show this to you books on determinism this is also something i want to discuss but first let me mention this so ideas like existentialism uh life has no purpose uh ideas like we need to do away with god we need to do away with man being at the top of the pyramid okay uh ideas like uh um, everything is determined for you, which is what we're going to discuss here. And then the idea of what, uh, well, you are the result of your genes. And so determinism does away with free will. And then you're the, you're the result of your environment, which is what determinism is, which became a big top topic in psychology, in sociology, in philosophy. Okay. And the idea of determinism is basically you have no free will. So, uh, you know, uh, f for example, this book on free will, freedom evolves, free will, a very short introduction, uh, uh, this and consciousness convention, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is the result of determinism, which was a big part of, uh, the result of this idea of humanism was, oh, well, we don't actually have free will, which is strange because prophets come and Islam comes and tells us we do have free will. Okay, and uh, humanism came and used science to tell us we don't have free will. They came and told us by science tells us not all human beings are equal. Some are successful, some are not successful. We should give everybody an IQ test and to see who should be eliminated. Really, I'm going to show you videos that talk about that at, at some point, maybe later. Um, and so uh, you had this person, okay, um, so one of the differences between philosophers, let's say in England, they basically brought in existentialism and determinism, which basically said, you're the re Okay. And then he kind of like said, oh, but in America, what happened is they started saying, you're the result of your genes. 
you're determined by your genes. Okay, and so this is what this philosopher, uh, Maurice, uh, was an American philosopher, and uh, he was big into the study of genes, and he said, oh, it's the genes that do everything. It's not even your environment. So this argument between nature versus nurture, right? So your environment uh, shapes you or your genes shape you. And, uh, you know, he was a professor, I think, at, uh, um, I forget what university. Um, but anyway, he so, so now genes and the whole eugenics movement and the whole movement of making people do abortions, especially in poor areas, uh, the sterilized, forced sterilization of poor people, uh, all that comes from this whole movement. Um, so now social, the humanism gives birth to this concept called scientific socialism. Okay. Uh, and uh, scientific socialism is basically social engineering. How do we... Using genes, using the environment, how do we create the type of human beings we want? Okay. And so, uh, what happens here is now human beings are not important. Uh, so now the rich decide through sociology and social engineering, what should we do with these human beings? Should we get rid of them? Should we keep them? Remember that professor I talked about that was from Texas, right? So all that's happening. So uh, this uh, philosopher, okay, he came up with the idea that it, it, it to create a scientific government, okay. So basically, look, this is what it is. Reason it will always uh, uh, the people who have reason will be the ones that are successful, okay, and they will be the ones that are in the helm of affairs. They're the ones that are going to rule the government, okay. So he says, thus, a given society, the authority of man over man is inversely proportional to the stage of intellectual development. Those that are smarter are going to rule over those that are not smart, okay? Which that society has reached. The probable duration of that authority can be calculated from more or less general desire for a true government. That is, for a scientific government, okay? So it goes on, but it is this whole idea that man who is intelligent, who is intelligent here, de facto? The one who is intelligent is the one who is successful. The one who is successful is the one who has fame and wealth and so on and so forth. They will rule over those who don't have those uh, things. And this is because they got wealth because they're more intelligent. And this is exactly what Quran says in Sutul Kahf. You know, he'll say, oh, well, this was all my doing. God didn't help me. I'm not, somebody's not poor because they're, 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 God made them poor. They're poor because they're lazy or because they're not intelligent or they're not successful. And so humanism is now leading to what? Dehumanism. And dehumanism is leading to what? The ideas of depopulation. Why? We had, well, we need to have billions of stupid people around. Let's get rid of them all. Uh, Frederick uh, Engels uh, wrote a very famous book on how people become dehumanized because of working in the factory or working for capitalists, right? So on the one side, this is also happening. So human beings are dehumanizing themselves uh, with this uh, culture, you can say, that we have, okay? With this culture that we have. And, uh, but also uh, through uh, eugenics, also through the philosophies by doing away with God, and then saying man is at top, and then coming up with philosophies that actually do away with man being on top. That man has no, uh, you know, there's, uh, with the ideas of determinism, you don't determine free will. With the ideas of your genes and eugenics, you are only as good as your genes, okay? Uh, with ideas of social Darwinism, with the ideas of existentialism, with the, all these things that were the dirty eggs of humanism, okay? Which now has made man dehumanized and now a lot of people believe in depopulation because of it and it's it's not by chance that they have abortion in the poor areas okay uh, i'm going to talk about that at another time and shall let's continue for now so uh galton wrote this book hereditary genius right that if you breed the right people you'll get very intellectual very smart people uh so this is where this is this is all leading to de now what if somebody is not part of that expert uh gene uh you know uh, 
recognition, is they're going to dehumanize the person that doesn't have the best genes. So Charles, Charles, Charles Darwin plays a big role. And it, it, it started with science, but it ended up affecting the social sciences, ended up affecting law, affecting law because sterilization, because a euthanasia was allowed, because of these very ideas, eugenics. And in the field of sociology and psychology and anthrop not anthropology, but a lot of the fields, they were, they were uh, affected, even religions were affected by Charles Darwin's uh, ideas. And Charles Darwin ideas started as something that puts man at, on the top. But once you make man his own ideal and the, he's only going to use his aql or his intelligence, the result is existentialism, determinism, uh, ideas of social Darwinism, social engineering, uh, why should we feed the poor people, you know, so on and so forth. I'm just pointing this out. Correspondence between Charles Darwin and Francis Galton. Okay. How uh, F uh, Francis Galton starts the subject of euthanasia, uh, sorry, uh, eugenics. Okay. Uh, the, the study and manipulation of a person's gene to like do what something like what Hitler did to create a Superman and the others are bad. Right. Uh, his correspondence with Charles Darwin uh, as a case in point. And then this guy, uh, Limbroso, was an Italian criminologist, okay, a physician, and found the Italian school of positive, positivist criminology, okay. Uh, so how does he determine who is a, who is a, a criminal? By looking at your genes. Oh, you got these genes? Okay. I mean, in the future, what are they going to do? They take a gene test and tell me? That, oh, I, I'm more likely to be a terrorist, or I'm more likely to be this, or I'm more likely to be that, or, oh, you got genes that will make you alcoholic, so we're going to put you in this category. This is where, this is the dehumanization process already underway, and it is a big part of the Great Reset. Okay? This will be a natural result. So this guy, for example, the theory of crime, criminal man, and activism. Activism is the idea that You'll go back to the way your ancestors, your ancestors, you know, if you are from Africa, your ancestors, they were kind of like cannibals. So even if you're living in modern society today, well, you probably have some tendencies from them. Okay. The, you're born criminal. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Lambroso's biological theory of criminology suggests that criminality is inherited and that someone born criminal could be identified by the way that they look. You can, can you imagine how racist that is? How dehumanizing that is? And why that would lead to de de depopulation of human beings? This man, Ludwig, he published a popular, uh, very, very popular um, work on heredity and its effects on morality and how you can determine somebody's morality based upon their genes. Okay. And it's, it, and I, I'm serious when I say this, this whole collection of the genes that happened during the COVID years. Uh, there can be a lot going on to this than we think, okay? And uh, so in the National Library of Medicine, for example, you have papers on ethical, legal, social, and policy implications of behavioral behavioral gen genetics or genetic. And of course, this very famous philosopher, Martin Hegeder, uh, you know, he was a German philosopher who was also talked about uh, the uh, the how genes influence people and he believed in what existentialism life has no purpose so humans when they were given their aql to run the world and when they created this godless society and wanted to do without god the best what they gave humanity was things like determinism things like existentialism things like uh social darwinism i mean you can go on with all the problems that they created and now we're in a situation where you know uh, where we are, we're creating subhumans and, uh, or dehumanizing human beings and justifying, uh, depopulation, uh, by looking at other human beings as stupid and not genetically fit. And you're the result of your, if you were born in a terrorist camp, then you can't escape that. And oh, by the way, your genes are not good either. And by the way, life has no purpose. And by the way, we don't, we don't really have a purpose in life um, and you can never really know anything uh, because, you know, we believe in logical positivism. This is the, the, the eggs or the dirty eggs of humanism. Okay, so this is where it's all going.
again, you have uh, Jean Paul, right? Sartre, uh, uh, Sartre, Sartre, I don't know how to say his name, but again, you know, Nietzsche, him, they all, what did they believe in? Existentialism. One of the major, major philosophies of this uh, last century. One of the major, I think this is like even more, I'd say out of all the philosophies, this is probably the most popular philosophy, existential. Life has no purpose. Life has no meaning other than what you give it. And rich, uh, successful people will give themselves, the rich people, the successful people. And I'm basically uh, talking about Nietzsche's uh, idea of the superman or the overman. Uh, yeah, successful people will give themselves some purpose, and that's the best we can do, but life has no purpose, and the rest of the people don't even, like, count. Okay? And it is no wonder uh, about our fascination with dehumanized humans. Uh, it comes in many shapes and forms, but I want to talk about particularly from Carl Jung's perspective, right? Certain archetypes. And if certain tar archetypes, certain ideas, certain images become very popular in the world that we live in, and anyone who has uh, been looking at the world, the idea of zombies, every child, like, you know, this like kind of like dehumanized humans that you have to get rid of, right? Is like, it, it, like there's a certain fascination. Uh, Stanford scholar explains why zombie fascination is very much alive. But the point, I'm, I'm taking it from a different perspective that in the collective human consciousness, okay, in the words of Carl Jung, in our collective consciousness, this is like the archetype of the, of the times, one of the main icons of the times. So what have we done to ourselves that, you know, we, we uh, kind of like uh, look at, we're, we're, we're at a place as humans where we are almost idealizing uh, this dehumanized uh, being uh, and killing it in video games and in movies and so on and so forth. What does that say about us, right, at the collective conscious level, that this is our, this is like the, one of the trends of our collective consciousness. So uh, dehumanization and alienation and then depopulation, these are just natural, these will be the natural results of the godless society that we live in. And so I gave you a little bit of history from religion to humanism and the philosophies it gave birth to, and now the cat catastrophic uh, results of that uh, that we will now see in the future, not far off. Uh, and so this is also, you can say, my critique of humanism and my critique of modern philosophy. But there's a lot more to it, as you'll see, inshallah, as I talk about these issues as time goes on, inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.